so what's my so my topic is encountering God um, <laughs> you think I'm kidding uh, am I okay a little ringy a little tenor maybe the monitors take take some out of the monitors so I have like these conflicting um, urges in me tonight. I'm just going to be, I'm going to self-disclose. Uh, I, I had a, a lovely talk prepared for you um, up until about 4 o'clock today. And so I had 13 pages of hard-fought theology and eschatology that I was going to share with you, and it was going to blow your mind. I mean, you don't even know what you're missing, um, <laughs> nor will you know what you're missing. And so at about four o'clock, I just, I just threw it all away and started over. And so, so I have these two conflicting urges. One is to tell my story, my personal story, my inner varsity story. And I don't think I've ever actually done that. In fact, I don't really, I don't like to talk about my own story, my own journey. It's not that I don't like to, I just don't um, usually do that. And so I have that sort of urge, like maybe I should do that. I should share part of my inner varsity story with you. And then I have this other urge, which I feel like is completely competing with that urge, which is to just talk about the greatness of God. And, to, and, and so I, I really think talking about myself and talking about God are kind of incompatible ideas. But I'm going to try to do it anyway. Um, you should probably, I mean, I don't think you need to know this, but I was, I, I, I still can remember the first time I ever met my childhood best friend, his name was Matt, and uh, we were about six, and our fathers took us on a fishing trip, and uh, I, I wasn't much of a fisherman, I still am not, my dad was into it, I, I didn't really love it, and we, but, what, but I do remember catching one fish, I think it was one fish, and I remember sort of bonding with this other little kid that was my age, exactly my age. Matt, and so, but yeah, th there's that picture. That was the first time we ever hung out, and then, of course, we became best friends. And I actually lived uh, about, I don't know, nine or ten houses down from Matt and his family, the McCullums, and we never knew, I never really knew what Matt's dad did for a living. It was, like, weird. He was, he was home a lot. He had, like, turned his garage into an office. And I just remember, like, he would stuff envelopes occasionally and do stuff like that. And then, and then I remember he, he would just disappear sometimes for, like, a week at a time or two weeks. So he was, like, traveling, but I didn't think he sold anything. And it was just weird. I never knew what his dad did. But I was always at his house. In fact, I would be at his house, like, any time, all hours of the night. I'd rather be at his house than my house. They were just the most unique family. They, they had no television. I remember that, and that was a big deal. You know, like, they, they purposely had no television. They read books, and I was like, what? You know, I don't think I read, I don't think I read my first book until I was 17, you know? And uh, I was just fascinated by these people. And, and I remember, like, he would have a nap time. So his mom, his mom would make him take a nap. And I remember he, he, she would be like, Brian, you have to go home. You have to leave. And I would just sit outside his window in the backyard. I would just sit against the wall and wait until his nap time was over. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to be near him, just with him. What a remarkable family. I never knew what his dad did. Do you know what his dad did for a living? He was the state director of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship in Florida. <laughs> What does that mean? <laughs> Doesn't it have to mean something? That I would become the state director of, in fact, we stopped having a state director in Florida, broke it up into two areas, and then three areas. That's, that's how Florida was designed from the time that Sid McCollum left. It broke into two areas and then three areas and didn't become one thing again until I, made it, I, I, I was a part of it becoming a division. What does that mean? How is that possible? And now it all comes back to me like images, pictures, like the dorky 80s logo. I still remember like the purple bar with like the bad Times New Roman intervarsity above it. <laughs> I remember that on his desk. It's all 
coming clear now. <laughs> if, if it's possible, if we can have an encounter with God in this lifetime, in this world, it's going to be an encounter with something, someone who is eternal, who is somehow not constrained by time. God is no more constrained by time than he is by space or power or virtue or love. And so to understand him, to like try to know him, to be accessible to him in some way, you have to understand that your future is as real to God, as present to God as you're present, as you're right now. There's something beautiful, symmetrical about the arc of history in our own personal lives it's like you have to pull back to see its beauty, to see the symmetry of what God is doing with these two little seven-year-olds running around in the front yard, and he knew exactly what he was doing. An encounter with God is an encounter with eternity, with everything that has been and will be. It's not just potential, that we're talking about, it's not just possibility. I mean, to encounter God is to encounter destiny itself. It is to encounter in one moment, in one sort of surreal existential experience, all your hopes and dreams fulfilled in the face of Christ Jesus. And by the way, I've read the whole book, I've read to the end, you win. I mean, I have good news. Some of you, like, get lost about Revelation 6, and you're just like, oh, it's too much blood, and I just, I'm out, you know what I mean? <laughs> the bowls and whatnot, and you're done. You win in the end. To them that overcome, to the victorious, I will give a crown of life. The road to victory, though, I have to tell you, is not straight. It is winding and bending. And once or twice in your life, I promise you this, once or twice in your life, you will crash. As if into a wall, because our enemy is real. But you will win. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, you will win. Your dreams, your holy ambition, I mean, the bit that's right at the center of that, because there's, there's some stuff that needs to be probably peeled away from that, but right in the middle, right in the center, that ambition, it will come to pass. It will come to pass. In the city that he will build for us. And so, you ought to live and lead and love and die and hope and dream and dare and fail and cry and dare to dare again. All I've ever wanted since I can remember, as long as my, I've been a Christian, as long as I have known the presence of God, all I've ever wanted was to know Him and to be used by Him, Amen. to serve Him, to be His, totally His. Anyone who knows me, anyone who's been around me for a long time knows I really just have one sermon. And it comes in various forms, but it's about relinquishing our whole lives, the surrender of all we are to Him. And in those moments when I feel that, when I know that, when I know that I'm really His, I think in those moments I feel like I can do anything. I can give anything, I can pay any price, but when I lose sight of that, who I am, who I belong to, his burning love for me, defining me, making me real, when I lose sight of that, I waver and I fear. But that longing for intimacy, which all of us have, that longing for intimacy with God, and whether you have words for it or not, whether you can explain it or not, whether you're even fully aware of it or not, that the longing that we all have for intimacy with God is inextricably bound to his apostolic nature. 
The desire to know God cannot be separated. It cannot be untangled from his apostolic nature. And I fear that we have given birth to a form of Christianity which has no hope of touching the face of God. It has no hope of knowing the eternal God in which it seeks. I still can remember my first year at the University of Florida. I can still remember, uh, you know, getting into the, the dorm and I was just like alive with God. I don't know if you, maybe you're in the middle of that right now, that moment where everything is real, everything is new to you with God. I grew up, well, I didn't really grow up a Christian. I came, became a Christian through the ministry of Young Life, and then I was a part of a Presbyterian church. And then I, when as soon as I got to college, I became Pentecostal, <laughs> which is obviously what you do, you know what I mean? <laughs> Isn't that an obvious path? Um, And I was just, like, I learned to worship, you know. I learned to, this sort of exuberant possibility with God, the Spirit of God. I was introduced to the Spirit of God. I can still remember being so sort of irrepressible in my faith that I just couldn't help but share the gospel with everyone. Poorly, I mean, pretty bad, I'm sure of it, but effectively. And and that's going to be an important point later. I don't think I was ever worse at explaining the gospel than then, and I was never more effective than then. And I want you to think about that. I remember my roommate, who was into transcendental meditation. You know, I, I didn't think in the late 80s anybody was into transcendental meditation anymore, but this cat was, you know what I mean? He would lay in his bed and say he was levitating. I'm like, bro, you're not levitating. You know? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm looking at you. Your bed is like depressed. You're not levitating. (laughs) Watch this. My hand won't go through. (laughs) He was very adversarial with me, which was fine because I'm combative by nature. So we would always argue about God. You know, he he would always take the opposite thing, opposite thing. At the same time, I had started meeting with these other kind of wild Christians. We would get together in these little rooms and we'd just pray all night and it was just like this fire that we had inside of us. And I remember one night we'd stayed up really late praying in one of the classrooms on campus. And we came back and I just, I, I, for some reason I was impressed on my, on my heart was Luke 15. And those of you that aren't good evangelists, like you don't feel like that's your primary gift, just tell people Luke 15 and you'll become a good evangelist. You know what I mean? The, the, the right scripture in the right time does the work for you. The word of God doesn't come back empty. It doesn't, it, 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 it does what God sends it to do. And I remember just explaining, I'm like, man, let me, can I just tell you this story? And he sat there. I remember I was sitting on my bunk bed. He was sitting across the room from me, kind of diagonal. And he just kind of sat where we put all our dirty dishes because we had like a door and we would stack up our dirty dishes and the door around it. <laughs> it was so gross. I mean, like, anyway. And so he, there, that's where he was sitting. And, and I remember just saying the, 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 I'm like, can you tell you the story? And so I told him the story of the, the prodigal son. And he, he just, he didn't say anything. He just got a, kind of got quiet and contemplative, and he just kind of sat there. And he goes, okay, man, well, you know, good night. <laughs> he just got up and went to his room, and I was like, what just happened? <laughs> like, he didn't argue with me at all. And something inside me, you know, the Holy Spirit just kind of empowered me. I said, no, 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 this, this does not end like this. So I go up and I follow him in his room. <laughs> and I'm like, you, you come back here. <laughs> so I followed him in his room and I said to him, I said, Jeff, aren't you tired of running? I'm like, man, come home. Tonight you could come home. And he just kind of looked at me with this, 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 openness, and, he, and, he, and I said, do you want to do that? And he said, Brian, I do. And then I was stuck because I didn't know how to lead someone to Jesus. <laughs> I was kind of like, oh, man. <laughs> now, the good news is I was now Pentecostal, and so 
Presbyterians don't know how to lead anyone to Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be straight with you. I'm just going to be straight with you. No, don't say that to D. James Kennedy. That guy could bring some people to Jesus. Anyway, I was Pentecostal now, so I knew what we need to do is have an altar call. So I'm looking around, I'm like, the bed will have to do. So we get over to the bed, I'm like, kneel down. So he kneels down, and I kneel down next to him. And I knew, you know, I knew the sinner's prayer, because I've been going to Pentecostal church. We're like, I'm going to pray a prayer. And he's like, okay. And I'm like, I'm going to pray a prayer. And he's folding his hands. It's so funny, he's folding his hands. Like, that's what you're supposed to do. And, and I'm like, I'm going to pray a prayer. If you agree with it, I want you to pray it after me. And if you believe it, then, you know, God will come into your life, and you'll be changed forever. And so I, 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 said, I said something like, you know, God, I, I give you my life. And I, I, I crap you not. His hands go, he just goes, God, he starts screaming. He puts his arms and he goes, God, I give you my life. I was as surprised as anybody. I was like, yeah, baby, yeah. We are Pentecostal. He got radically saved. In fact, um, it's, it's a kind of a long story, but InterVarsity, I sort of found InterVarsity, they sort of found me, and uh, they came, they, they, the InterVarsity leadership asked me if I would be the evangelism coordinator. I didn't know what that meant. I wasn't a part of InterVarsity. <laughs> they came to me, and they're like, will you be the evangelism coordinator? They called me, so will you be the evangelism coordinator? And I was like, who are you, people? <laughs> but it sounded good. It was like a bunch of Christians that wanted to be coordinated in evangelism. <laughs> And I thought, let's do that. Yeah, let's do that. Little did I know what they meant was, we don't like evangelism and we need someone that does, you know. Uh, we don't do evangelism, but we need someone that does. And so you're the only, we had to outsource because there's nobody in our, in our group. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. The way that they did leadership selection at the time was that they would get the whole group together. It was very, it was very sort of fl flat uh, leadership model, they would get the whole, all the students together, and everybody that was up for a certain position, president, treasurer, whatever, uh, in my case, evangelism coordinator, small group coordinator, whatever, they, they, would, they would put you up front, and you would sit there, like, like, like giving speeches, like why I should be the whatever, whatever, and so there would be three people, and they would kind of share, and then you would leave the room, and then everyone would pray to decide who got the position, uh, sort of pray, ask the Lord, who do you want to be in this position, kind of interesting, kind of a cool way to select people. When it came to evangelism coordinator, there wasn't another person, it was just me. Like, nobody was up for it but me. So I sat up on the stage by myself, you know, with the whole group there in the living room, and I was like, okay, you know, like, seriously, we're doing this? You know, like, I'm the only person that wants it, you know? And they made me leave the room and prayed as to whether or not... They're like, well, thank you, you know, if you could just step out. I was like, well, I don't understand. What's, it's me or don't do it at all. And they were seriously considering, maybe we shouldn't do it at all. And actually, my now wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, Monica, she was in the room. I was like, what happened? What'd they say? She was like, it was close. I mean, it was... <laughs> it could have gone either way. So Jeff, who had become a Christian, I guess he was my apprentice. I had no idea what that meant or what was going on. But he eventually became, he was the evangelism coordinator after me. He became the evangelism coordinator in that chapter and was super, super passionate about evangelism because that's how, obviously, his life had been totally changed. I remember before I was a part of InterVarsity, so Jeff come, becomes a Christian, and then a girl uh, up, upstairs became a Christian, then another girl upstairs led to Christ, and then the guy across the hall came to Christ. There was like five, six, seven, eight people that came to Christ. So we're looking around like, what do I do? What do I do? I had no leadership, no training, <laughs> none, zero. I mean horrible. And yet, and yet, I was like, what do we do? So I just thought, well, you should have a Bible study. That's what Christians should do. Christians should have Bible studies. That's what they should do. And so we decided to have a Bible study in our room. We had a Bible study and I would lead the Bible study. Now, I'm just want to tell you, I did every single thing wrong you could possibly do. I want you to, staff workers, just go here and ima imagine with me. I would skip all, it was a Monday night. We would do it on Monday. I would skip all of my classes on Monday nights to prepare Bible study. I didn't do well that semester. 
I skip all my classes on Monday night, and I would go. I had a closet in my dorm. I would go into the closet, and I would pray for five, six, or seven hours. I would write down every, because I didn't know what, I, I thought Bible study you had to be like a scholar or something. So I would like do all this like cross-referencing and try a bajillion verses. Now imagine how long that Bible study takes to have. <laughs> you follow me? Are you doing the math in your head? I'm like, I prepared for this Bible study. So I didn't, I didn't ask questions. There was no inductive process happening. I preached for three hours every Monday night. Three hours. And then at the end of it, I am not kidding. And it was packed every single time. 20, 30, 40 kids would pile into my room, God knows why, to listen to me for three hours. I was never more ignorant in my life than I was then, and almost never more powerful. We would finish, sometimes we would finish these super marathon Bible studies, people just, just alive, alive with the scriptures, I mean alive with them. Every reference mattered. It was like lights coming on for all of us. And at the end of it, every single time, we would pray late into the night. We would just, we would just bless God and we would just cry out for our campus. And often we would spill out into the campus and either try to share our faith late at night or just intercede. I'm telling you guys, everything I have ever done since is an attempt to recapture that moment. There's something that happens to us at some formative moment in our life where we see that the kingdom is real, that we see that the book of Acts is possible, and it, it impresses itself upon our psyche. And in many ways, because I don't know if it's because we're young or because we're ignorant, but there's something about the, the, our, our openness to God in that moment that we become His, fully His, and in that full surrender and in the wonder of knowing Him in that moment, we chase that for the rest of our lives. Chase that moment to see it again somehow, to see it again. We had no building. We had no money. We had no leaders. We had no one trained, no mission statement, no website, no, no vision, no structure. S deal with this for a second. No vision, no structure, no direction, really. We did everything that you could think of to make a ministry not work. The meetings were too long, they were disorganized, the commitment I called for was way too high. <laughs> the sense of direction was non-existent, but we all sensed that we were in somehow the kingdom of God had come into that place and he was there and we got to stay with him. Why would we leave? We lingered as long as we possibly could because we sensed his very real presence. I, 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 I never even told this, this part of the story before, but I remember the, the area director at the time would come. He, he would somehow come and, and visit campus, and, and because he knew me, he would come, and he would come to some of our prayer meetings, and he would just sit there and just soak it in, like, like we had something that he was trying to remember. Why do we plant? Why? Why am I still doing it after all these years? Why do we leave the comfort of the known place in favor of the unknown place? Why take that risk? Why pay that price? I mean, aside from Jesus said to, seriously, why? Why did he say to do it? And 23 years later, I still think I'm that same first year, I, I don't think fundamentally I've changed at all. Still that same first year in that dorm at the University of Florida. 
we chase a future we somehow remember. And I have to read these words to you. This is the bit of scripture that I want to stand upon tonight. And these words move me beyond words. I, 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 I don't even, I am not worthy to read them to you. But I'm all you have, so here I go. Um, <laughs> Revelation 21, and then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, look at God's dwelling place is now among people, and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people and God himself will be with them and he will be their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death and no more mourning and no more crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on, seated on the throne, he said, I am making all things new. And then he said, write, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. What is finished? To the, to the one who is thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Think about that. And those who are victorious will inherit all of this. And I will be their God, and they will be my children. Why give your life for the mission of God? Why give your life for planting, for, for his apostolic work? Why? Why sacrifice your future? Why sacrifice your money and your education? Why do it? I don't know why you should do it, but I'm going to tell you tonight why I do and the first reason is I plant, I plant because I dream of a world where there is no sea. It's the first image that he gives us, John the revelator gives us of, of this new world, this new heaven and new earth. There is no sea there. Of course, for the ancient mind, the sea is a symbol of chaos. It's the ultimate expression, the ultimate image or metaphor of fear, of the unknown of danger. And so it stands to reason that this world that is to come, the world that, is, that God is making for you and for me, for his bride, it will have no sea, no chaos. It will have no evil, no injustice, no bigotry, no judgment. I mean, some people have asked me you know, how I feel about this Ferguson thing, and you know, our, our community has been hit really hard by it because we are a multi-ethnic community. And I mean, it, 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 for, for, for us, it, was, it has been uh, like a trauma that has happened to particularly to our black leaders, but, you know, uh, indirectly to all of us as a family traumatized by it. And if you don't understand that, I can't help you. Not tonight. Ask somebody. But I'll say this. This is how I feel about it. When Twitter starts lighting up about Ferguson, it starts lighting up about racial injustice in America, and all of a sudden, it's like a hot issue. You know what I think? I think, hey, world, welcome to the world. Welcome to reality. Because, by the way, black people already knew. It's not like, oh my gosh, there was, they didn't, they didn't indict him. What, what a shocking thing that is. I, I can't believe that the justice system is biased against black people. Well, I never knew that. I, no, no, 
white America didn't know that. The truth is, you know, I just feel like the, the, the world is waking up to something that's already, of course, was already there. There is not a single metric in the American justice system that is not biased against black people. Just look it up. And by the way, it was like that before Ferguson. I mean, do <laughs> you know what the real sin of, to me, the real sin of, of these minimizing white Christians, the, the real heresy of these white Christians that are like, what? It's that, it's that they actually believed that America was a good place. That they actually believed that America was this perfect, just nation. We wouldn't do that to our black people, not anymore. We're enlightened, we're better. That's the heresy. That slowly over time, we begin to put our hope in something other than Jesus, other than God. And the truth is, that's the old order of things. And we're still in the middle of, that's a very, that's a very tame clap. White people don't know what to do. You know, they're like, ah, uh, <laughs> yes. Do I, do I clap? It's like against myself. Do I, I don't know. <laughs> Yay. We love you. It's okay. I'm white. It's okay. <laughs> it's not okay, but... It's okay, you know, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> we don't treat black people like that anymore. What? No, what? How, why are you saying that? What? Read something, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know? It's just like... And people ask me, you know, some of my leaders ask me, should we march? Should we march? Should we go out and protest? Should we do something public? Go ahead and listen, there is a place for that. In fact, in its right place, and right context, right time, yeah, totally, we should do that. But I mean, to me, you know, my response is to my people, if we should march, I'm like, yeah, you should march every single day. You should be marching to and from a more just world. You should be marching to and from the kingdom being built everywhere around you. And if you're not doing that, please don't wake up today and start doing it somewhere just for one weekend. I mean, so, so it gets hot on social media, so now we're going to go act? Why? That's just a trend. In fact, what I would say is when everyone else is marching, wait and march the next day, or wait until the next week and then march. And, and, and what I'm saying is, listen, when, 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 when my black leaders are pouring into black youth in, 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 in disadvantaged and economically challenged areas every single day of their lives, they're marching. They're protesting. I mean, I can't speak for everyone in InterVarsity. I mean, I'm sure you have your skeletons or whatever, but guys, you as an organization have been teaching this stuff. You have been challenging white supremacy and challenging white privilege for decades. For as long as I've known you, you have been beating that drum. You have been talking about it. And just because it cools off and it gets hot and cold again, we don't stop teaching that to students. We don't stop just because, okay, people want to talk about it now. Good, let's talk about it. We were talking about it before, and we're going to keep talking about it afterwards. And maybe for a while, it gets a little easier because the rest of America is interested. Fine. But we were doing it before. I mean, it speaks for our community. We were doing it before. We're going to keep doing it after. You're done thinking it's cool or interesting. Welcome to the party, everyone else. You guys have been struggling for racial reconciliation, sometimes winning, sometimes losing, for as long as I've known you. And students, those of you that are fresh or new to InterVarsity, you, you've stepped into that. And it's tense, man. It's not always easy. And by the way, if you came to that party for something cool and smooth and easy, you just need to get out now because it's not going to be like that. But man, that's okay because... We follow a God that took up a cross. It's, it's, it's what we do. It's who we are. We're not afraid to suffer. And by the way, if anyone can teach us that, the theology of the cross, the practice of the cross, it's black people. And you better listen. You better open your eyes. Man, we don't just plant so we can be on the cool cutting edge of university, and that's a threat here too. Because now you can start to feel a little superior to everybody else in the university that didn't come to ambition. 
And so you might just feel like, hey, man, I'm going to plant because I want to be on the cutting edge of InterVarsity. I don't want to be some dorky normal staff worker that just <laughs> takes a regular campus job or whatever. <laughs> I'm going to be a planter, man. I'm going to smoke cigars and roll my pants. and <laughs> I'm going to be a planter. And by the way, you don't just plant because you want to be adventurous. Some of you have some sort of adventure-seeking flow. You just got like the adrenaline thing. You like that, so you're going to do that. Please, stop it. Get out now. Don't just plant because you even have the gifts for it. And you don't plant because you want to make your mark on this world. Or God forbid, because you want to build some kind of little alternative kingdom to the kingdom of God where you're somebody. You plant because you're soldiers in a spiritual war. Listen to me. You plant because evil, all evil is death, and death, death must be resisted. I love Paul Tillich. The strange work of love, he says, is to destroy all that is not love. The strange work of love is to destroy all that is not love. We love students and campuses that no one else will love or invest in because we want to see the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Because we're willing to lay down our lives in a cosmic struggle which began at the beginning of human history. And so we dream and we labor for its end to destroy all that which is not love. We're in a fight. You're in a fight. And it's time to go bare knuckle. We're in a fight. Jesus was sent by the Father, but why? Why was he sent by the Father? You are sent by the Son, but why? And this is, this is what John says, this is why Jesus Christ came, to destroy all the works of the evil one. Do you know that? Jesus was in a fight, and so are you. Racism is a demonic stronghold that we exercise when we preach Jesus Christ in fullness to students. Yes, it's that serious. I plant because I dream about a world where there is no sea. I plant also because I hate death and despair. And if you think about it, you do too, or you should, or something's really wrong with you. I hate it. I hate death. I hate it. Hate, hate, hate it. I despise it, and I'm pretty sure it despises me. I have picked a fight with death. Well, maybe more to the point is it has picked a fight with me, but I'm not backing down. I don't want to die. <laughs> maybe that's, that's true. Uh, <laughs> and if it's okay with you, I'm not going to, like ever. What does the creed say? I believe in the resurrection and the life everlasting. Our story, guys, listen, our story without God, your friend's story without God, your campus's story without God is a story about death and dying. It's of a road of death because the wages of sin is death. It's a story about the sea and death and Hades which is judged and condemned in the final act of Scripture and all that comes with it. You know, we're fond of saying, uh, 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 people are fond of saying that, that death is a part of life, they say. But it isn't. No, shut up. It isn't a part of life. Death is the enemy of life. It always has been, and all sin leads to death. You see, guys, cancer is death. Betrayal is death. Molestation is death. Police brutality is death. Child abuse is death. Infidelity is death. Stealing, death. Drug addiction, death. Pornography is death. Exploitation is death. And of course, violence and murder, it's death. This is a story that we are living about the legacy and the narrative of death work around us. That is the old order of things. Because an atom all die, 
because death is really the great enemy of humankind. Well, Brian, bro, chill. We're just talking about chapter planting. Whoa. <laughs> what the heck? I just wanted to come to Florida, man. <laughs> My staff worker was like, Florida. I was like, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> Brian, chill. Don't be so dramatic. Wrong. Thank you. My man. Guys, Jesus is the second Adam. He comes to bring life, to reverse death, to take its sting, to gloat in victory over the thing that has gloated in victory over every human being since Adam. And to live, he came to live in the face of death, to cheat it and steal from it. To write the first story of a human being who does not die but who rises and lives. And to invite us all into that story. Guys, judgment that happens in these, these final pages of Scripture, judgment isn't just for people or the devil. Judgment, if you read this text right, judgment is of death. Death itself is judged. The grave is judged and destroyed. Death is destroyed because it is our great enemy, and he has come to lay one final mortal blow to our great enemy, and we are a part of that struggle. And this represents the dawning of a new age, a new world without death. It is the end of the story of death. One day, the dwelling of God will be with people. And this is our news. We, we carry it, guys. You, you're not, don't, don't take your little proxy stations and go out there and just be like, hey, I'm here to talk about InterVarsity. That's fine. That's not what you're there to talk about. I mean, I want, I, guys, please don't hear what I'm not saying. I love InterVarsity. I'm glad you're doing it. But InterVarsity just becomes a platform for this great word, this great message that you have about the defeat of death. I mean, we're not playing around here. Uh, you're in the big leagues, kids. And we carry this message in our bodies and our souls. And so we are fearless. We ought to be fearless. You know, the number one command in Scripture is fear not. Command. Listen to me. Listen to me, you know, shaky, courage, challenged people in the room. Listen to me. Fear not. Do not fear. We risk anything. We die even because we know we cannot die. So when I was hired, so there I am, I, 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 get, I get invited, I, I was doing my own thing as I explained, and then I get invited to a, an InterVarsity Bible study. Of course, I had my thing going on, and um, this girl that used to come to my, my Monday night gathering, she just kept saying, man, you should, come, you should come to this other Bible study I go to, it'd be great, you should really come. Her name was Beth fiery red hair, like vampire white skin, and, uh, and she, I don't know why I told you that, but you have a picture now on your head, um, and she, she just, she just kept inviting me, she kept inviting me, you have to come to this Bible study, and I, I sort of put it off for a long time, and then finally, I said, okay, and so I went to this Bible study, and that's how I first started meeting InterVarsity people, I, incidentally, I didn't do well in my first InterVarsity Bible study, as you can imagine. So they're sitting around doing inductive Bible study, which I'd never heard of, and I, I thought it was quite stupid, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, it's like the leader was asking everyone else what the answers were. I was like, what's wrong with this leader? You know, he, does, <laughs> he literally doesn't know anything about the Bible. What do you think Paul means when he says blah, blah, blah? I'm like, is he serious? I'm looking around like, can we fire this guy and get a new leader? On top of it, he insisted on giving every single person a hug or they couldn't leave the Bible study. I was like, I'm going to kick you in the groin if you come over here and try to hug me. <laughs> I still remember, he's like asking questions and I'm looking around like, 
And people just give these dumb answers, these little like plop, 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 like the blind leading the blind, you know, just plop, 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 these weird answers. I was like, so I would just, eventually I would just burst the silence and be like, I'll tell you what Paul means when he says that. And I'd go on for 20 minutes, you know, about horror. I'm the worst person to ever come to an inductive Bible study. I don't know how they put up with me. In fact, I'm sure they're all rolling their eyes like, man, what is wrong with this guy, you know? But Monica went to that Bible study, and so I came back. I, I kept coming back. <laughs> it's the only reason, I'm going to be honest with you. That's it. I didn't come back for the hugs, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but man, InterVarsity healed me. It changed me. I still remember someone prophesying over me when I was very young and saying, Brian, love will complete your anointing. That's what they said to me. Like you have truth, but you don't have love. InterVarsity taught me how to love. InterVarsity taught me how to work as a team. InterVarsity taught me how to listen to people. And some of you were like, no, it didn't, Brian. You still don't have any of those things. <laughs> yes, it did. You should have met me back then. You know, like I've come a long way, you know. Um, I mean, it really, it really changed me. I, I owe a huge debt, you know, to, to InterVarsity for that. And so I still remember when my staff worker sat me down and there in the rights union and, and, and just sat across from me in a booth and just said, Brian, I want you to consider staff work. And I, and I laughed in his face. I laughed in it out loud, like a, like a loud, <laughs> shaming kind of laugh, you know. <laughs> but the, that staff worker actually left in the last year that I was a student leader. We had no staff worker. And uh, so we kind of took over, and it was great. You know, the ministry even grew during that year. Um, the moral of the story there is staff aren't useful. No, that's not the moral <laughs> of the story. Uh, we really struggled the year after that because a lot of the things that he was doing behind the scenes, you know, we didn't see, and it hurt us, you know, the year after, after I left too. But, you know, I, and I, so I remember the, the area director at the time was a, a, a guy called pa Paul Hughes, and he, he just really pressed me to think about staff, and of course I did. I, I came on staff. But I didn't know, what I didn't know was behind the scenes, there was this, like, debate going on about whether they should hire me. And it was, like, hot and heavy. Like, most people in the hiring chain or pipeline or process were against my hiring. And they just thought it's too risky. I mean, seriously, they thought this guy is like a loose cannon or he's like not teachable or I don't know what they thought. I mean, I can imagine because I know what my sins were and that kind of thing. But, you know, he's just too proud or he's too, so I don't know, you, you name it, I, I, I probably was it, uh, too much it. But he really, went to, he really went to bat for me. In fact, last ambition, I told a little bit of this story because Paul Tokunaga was in the room. He was the regional director at the time. And he was in the room and I said, I want to thank Paul Toganaga, because he, he believed in me, he, he stood for me, like he was the RD that signed off on the AD's hiring of me, and I just said, I just want to publicly thank you, you changed my life because you took a chance on me, and he came up to me after that seminar, at Ambition last time, and he said, Brian, I still was against it, don't give me credit for that, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, I don't, I, I was the, I was one of the ones saying, don't do it, you know, <laughs> I was like, Really? Man. Well, thanks for nothing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so here was, the, here was the thinking. Here was the logic. You know, he's too much of a risk. He, he could really do a lot of damage. He could really mess a lot of crap up. And so here's what we're going to do. Let's put him somewhere where there are no students. We have no chapter. planting. Nobody else was doing it, but like, let's do it with this guy, you know. <laughs> and you know what? I love that logic. I love it. it. That did not hurt me or offend me. In fact, I would tell that story. They put me here because they didn't want to put me with actual students that they had and didn't want to lose. <laughs> it's like testing a nuclear bomb. You have to do it in the desert, you know, away from populated areas. <laughs> You don't test a nuclear bomb, like, downtown. <laughs> you drop it where it can't hurt anybody. It, 
that did not hurt my feelings at all. It liberated me. I'm going to tell you something. It liberated me. I literally felt like I could not fail because I couldn't lose any students. It's the beauty of planting. If you reach one student, you should probably quit because you don't deserve a salary, but if you reach one student, it's too much if you think about it. It's too much money for one student, I'm just saying. But if you, if you just reach one student, you've done something in the world that wasn't done before. I love that. I loved it, the liberation that it gave me to go and to start something. What could I mess up? And they were right. I had no planting training. I had no cohort. They gave me no money. I had no colleagues who were also planting. I remember standing on the parking deck, the top parking deck of USF my first day there, totally, you know, totally overwhelmed by this 40,000 person campus and I'm just thinking I'm small who am I what can I do and yet I prayed I began to there was 12 sort of dorm units on on that campus at the time and I said God wouldn't it be something if we could be on 12 in every single have a missional community in every single one of these 12 dorms within three years we were on all 12 of those dorms we built one of the biggest commuter school ministries in the country at the time listen that 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 set me on a path a motion I remember, I still remember my first year at USF, I worked out every day. And of course, I don't know why I did this. I just look back, it's just reading the script that was my life. Every day I worked out at another campus, Bayboro campus in St. Pete. I would drive to St. Pete, work out there, and pray for that campus before I would go to work at Tampa's campus. In the second year, I ate lunch at least once a week at the University of Tampa right on the river there where the squirrels come right up to you. I would eat, I would just go there by myself and just pray for that campus. I don't know why. I'm not a big time waster. I'm a pretty efficient person, yet I would do that. In my third year, I started a Bible study at Hillsborough Community College just because I met a student who went there. And so we started a Bible study there. I moved into the inner city. I started an urban project. I started a year-round justice initiative. I started a Spanish-speaking ministry before there was La Fe. I started an intentional community. Eventually, they made me an area director. They actually made where I was an area because I asked them to. I don't play well with others, I guess. You know, like, I don't want to be someone else's. I want to be my own. Let me have my own area. And so they agreed. And they gave, they carved out what is now, I think, called Florida Bay, this sort of Tampa Bay area. And they said, you can, we'll, we'll create an area just for you, probably because we don't want you on anyone else's team anymore. <laughs> um, there might be some truth to that. Um, and so I was finally able to hire Jeremy and Jessica and, and put them at Hillsborough Community College so they could plant there. And then Jason put him at USF, and then I, then I stole a staff candidate from Minnesota. Thank you, Minnesota. I didn't know it was wrong to do that at the time. I just want to apologize, go on record and apologize for doing that. <laughs> and she, Allison, planted at USF St. Pete, and then Stacy and a whole team of people moved to St. Petersburg planted at St. Pete College and then Eckerd College and then eventually we came back and planted at the University of Tampa. And we, 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 within a matter of just a few years, we had reached every major campus in our area. And so I asked them, I went to them, I said, can, can I have Florida? Can I be the, can, can we make Florida division? It wasn't, it was just part of the Southeast region. I can, can Florida be a division and can I be the divisional director? <laughs> can I? That's how I get promoted. I invent places to promote <laughs> myself too. <laughs> I don't want to displace anybody, you know. It's the blue ocean strategy of InterVarsity uh, upper management. Just create a job and just step into it. It's fine. <laughs> and within a few years, we had doubled the campuses that we were on in the state of Florida. I've prayed on every recognizable campus in this state. I've preached the gospel on half of them. And I'm going to say something to some of you today. If you feel like you are a risky play, if you feel like you're, 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 you're unworthy, I want you to listen to me very carefully. We are the risky ones. We are the cast-offs. 
We are the second sons. And you give us the ends of the earth. We'll take them. Amen. We'll take them. And you know why that's okay? Because God loves risky disciples. The less likely you are to do well, the more likely God is to want to use you. Because he gets more glory from the screw-ups. Because when a thing goes well, nobody goes, it's because of Brian. They all go, man, that must be God. (laughs) There's just no other way it could be anything else other than God. And nobody knows that more than me. Nobody. I know who I am. I know my, fa- my failures. I know my foibles better than you do, I promise you. And I am not worthy to do what I do. But he has made me worthy. You tell me you're not the right person for planting. You know what I have to say to you? You just qualified yourself. <laughs> now listen. Listen. Paul Hughes and Paul Tokunaga, they believed in me. They took a chance on me, and I will forever love them for that. But you listen very carefully. They may have believed in me, but the Spirit of God lived inside of me. Before anyone took a chance on me, God did. God did. And I always want to be where no one is because of that. This is my ambition, too, because I I don't want to mess anything up. And I am broken and weak and intemperate. And I don't want to damage something that's been around for 100 years. Please don't put me in charge of something like that, you know. But I also know that the poor and the forgotten and the ignored, I find they don't mind my inadequacies as much. I find that only church people, Pharisees, can't suffer me. Some of you are like, did he just call me a Pharisee? Because I don't really like him that much. (laughs) Yes, I did. (laughs) I jest. Uh, Sort of. I I, I just found that the commuter college student that that had almost no ministries on their campus, they were happy to have me. There's something right about that. I think ordinary people are the best people to plant because when you watch them do it, you think, I could do that. See, when an ordinary person does something and you watch them do it, it it does something to you, it empowers you. You think, I could probably do that. It's like the Ramones. Anyone remember that horrible band called the Ramones? These are are like dudes that were so ugly, they just wouldn't have made it anywhere in today's modern sort of celebrity. And they just like literally got a guitar, learned three chords, and just said, let's hit it super hard and just bang it out, and we'll make songs with like no lyrics, and people love them. And the Ramones, what the Ramones did for music is they made every kid go buy a guitar and say, I could freaking do that. Are you serious? (laughs) That's a rock band? Let's go. I want to be like... um, I've always wanted to be like the, the Velvet Underground. There's a, 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 one, a one-off album, 1967. It was, a, it was Andy Warhol's house band. It's called the Velvet Underground. And so they put out one album, the Velvet Underground and Nico. And it was so different, so weird, so bad. Brian Eno, the famous music producer, once said of that album, only 10,000 people ever bought that album, but every single one of them started a band. And that's what I want to be. I, I don't care about being known or, or, or renowned or fame. In fact, I feel, I feel quite, quite an animosity toward all of that. But if I could just take a few people and they could all start a band, that'd be great. If your life could be like that. And so they let me leave. Eventually, they let me leave InterVarsity. And we came after the rest of our city. And in seven years, we have empowered, trained, and planted more than 250 churches, nonprofits, and mission initiatives. We kept going. Thank you for that small clap offering. I, I received that. No, you don't have to. It's okay. It's okay. But you know what InterVarsity did for me? And I know I'm going long, but 
This, I think, pretty sure this is my only chance, so <laughs> get comfortable, stretch the legs, whatever you need to do. You know what InterVarsity did for me, and even for the underground, for helping make this remarkable community that I'm a part of now, that I get to be a part of? It gave me permission, and I think that is at the core of apostolic movement, of the thing that we all dream about. It's about permission, and I like the word permission because uh, uh, the etymology matters in this case. Now, there's a, it's hard to figure out the exact etymology of this particular word, and there's a couple of theories about it, but my favorite theory is that from, you know, it's per and then mission, and that, that prefix could mean, it, one, one possible rendering of the etymology there is the father of. In other words, what does it take to father mission, to see it birthed into the world, to sire mission? What does it take? It is permission. That is what it is. We will not see replication, we will not see empowerment, we will not see creativity, we will not see innovation unless somebody in authority gives somebody else permission. Probably the primary thing that I do, and I've, I've, I found it bizarre when I first would sit across from a young leader who had an idea, I want to I reach homeless people and I want to start, but is that okay? And they're looking at me like, can I do that? Is that okay? And I'm, I'm just like, who are you looking? Are you look, you're looking at me? If you're looking at me, I bless thee, go thou and go and I, yes. And I realized that, that I had authority to do that, that they were giving that to me and that God had given that to me. And I, I, I use that freely. And I have commissioned more people than you can imagine because every single person with a God-inspired idea, I bless them. And it, it stands to reason then to stand in their way would be not only contrary to loving them, but it would be contrary to knowing and loving God and seeing Him used in the world. The fact that people, and I say this to my pastor friends, when I hear story after story of a young Christian that sits across some big desk from a pastor and says, I have a heart to do this, and that pastor literally says to them, that's not our vision, no. And I, and I say to my pastor friends, how dare you? How dare you say that to them? I can be very intimidating when I want to, and so I like to scare pastors into <laughs> being more godly, you know. Half kidding, <laughs> again. Uh, <clears throat> but this is the father of mission, permission, and, and, and InterVarsity did that for me. It gave me permission one time after another. Let me grow it. Let me try, and I will forever be in debt to InterVarsity for that. You will, always have, you will always have me as your advocate. You will always have me fighting for you and raising money for you and doing everything I can for you and being a part of you. As long as you let me be like a cousin, I'm in. Even though I'm the, the bad cousin you don't want at every party. I understand that. That's okay. I accept that. Did you know, did you know that 80% of all women in America who own a business, think of, that's a big number, 80% of all women in America who own a business were Girl Scouts. Did you know that? Check out the Girl Scouts. <laughs> I mean, what, what was it? What was it about Girl Scouts that so radically empowered women to step into this male-dominated field of business ownership? What was it about the Girl Scouts? I mean, was it, the, was it the little badges? Was it the brownie uniforms? Was it the hats? What was it? I'm going to tell you what it was. I don't know this for sure. It's my theory. You know what it was? It was the cookies. <laughs> Think about it. You take these adorable little girls in their little outfits and their little hats, and you give them an incredible product to sell. And they knock on your door. Hello. Would you buy some of my cookies? <laughs> Two things working against you at that moment. A, the little girl is asking you to do something. B, you want those cookies. <laughs> you, you don't stand a chance. By the way, what a devious business model that is, you know what I mean? It's just, that's a whole separate thing. But I wonder, I wonder if these little girls just get a taste of, 
of enterprise. They get a taste of success in selling. And I wonder if something changes in our psyche if early on we see that, that we're powerful in that way, that something like that could happen. And so I don't know. I don't know exactly, but what happens to the, the psyche of a Girl Scout that just nailed it selling cookies? Like it, was, it was easy. Like the world just opens up for me when I, when I go sell stuff. I'm made to do this. And so later in life, they just believe they can start a business. Guys, I want to say something. I'm a Girl Scout. Somebody better tweet that. I'm a Girl Scout. <laughs> uh, so I'm so late. I'm sorry. We, we, guys, we all should be Girl Scouts. That's all I'm saying. That's enough of that. Let's just leave that alone. Let's just, let's just move on. Man, go start something. Go, go plant something. And God will bless that. He'll kiss that first thing, I promise you. Something amazing, some little piece of heaven. And it'll never be that easy again, also, I promise you. But God will make it so that, you're psych- so that you believe, I could do this. I could do this over and over again. And you'll be ready for the failure that comes. You think these women that go and start businesses, you think it's as easy as selling Girl Scout cookies? It isn't, but they stick with it because something changed in them early on. And this is what I believe we can do for students, staff. This is, students, what you can figure out for yourself right now at this critical, formative moment in your life, in your spiritual life. Be brave. Take a risk. Step out. Do something crazy, even outside of what your staff wants you to do, and see that God doesn't bless it, kiss it, and change you forever. Make you his. Make you his little planter forever and ever and ever, because I'm going to do this until I die. And the reason why I'll do it until I die is because This is in me. I can't not do it. I belong to him now. And my final reason is because it's romantic. It's because this, I have been, I plant because I have to, because I am swept up in a romance, a fairy tale. We plant, I think we all should plant because we have heard and believed a love story. A fairy tale, a cosmic romance. And we all get swept up in it somehow. Guys, the Bible ends with a story about an ancient dragon slain by a rider on a white horse. And we, the host of heaven, in washed robes, his host, triumphant, vindicated, It is the story of the triumph of love and the vanquishing of evil. Babylon falls and a hero reigns after all. What is that if not a fairy tale? And we follow him and to follow him, we must believe in it. We must put our hope in that story. And write this down, John heard, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end to the thirsty. I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. This is literally the fountain of youth. And to the secular mind, it is a fairy tale. But to us, to us, it is gospel truth. Because the gospel is itself a fairy tale. A true fairy tale. The world of once upon a time and happily ever after, because the arc of history is a fairy tale, a true one that all the other fairy tales are looking for, searching for when they spin their yarn. And to preach the gospel is to claim that once upon a time is our time, and that happily ever after will be our end. And therefore we hope, and we resist the world's despair with hope. And guys, the person with the most hope should lead. Get get these pessimistic Christians away from me. The person with the most hope should lead. While our boats thrash on the seas of chaos, we believe that one day the dwelling of God will be with men. It is a dream. It is just a child's tale. But it is true because our Father who does not lie has told us it will happen. And this bedtime story is real. I love Frederick Buechner, one of my favorite writers. Buechner says this, it is sentimentality. It is wishful thinking. It is escapism. 
It is dodging the issue. It is whistling in the dark. It is childish. And amen, we have to say to the whole cheerless litany because we all know it by heart and because we all know it is true. But if this is only a dream, then it is the most haunting and powerful dream that the world has ever dreamed. And there is no culture or era where we have not all dreamed it. I mean, even the idea that we would say, and we do say, it's too good to be true. We say that. But that implies, to say that something is too good to be true, implies something about our view of the truth. That it is somehow dark and disappointing, the truth. But we have all met the truth. I have met the truth. He has a name. And all of us that have met Jesus can say without reservation that nothing is too good for the truth. The truth is the highest good and the telling of it means that it must end, as all fairy tales do, with the beloved rescued and the people living happily ever after. Beekner goes on, I love this, he says, why, why do we spend vast sums of money to go to the moon and to Mars? You hear all kinds of solemn talk about learning this or that, but anybody who knows anything, any child, and the child in any of us, knows that we go shooting off into space just because, just possibly, impossibly, the Wizard of Oz will be there. And this is a fairy tale about romance. Three times in the New Testament, God utters the words, it is finished. Three times. The first, as you know, is on the cross by Jesus. It is finished. And redemptive history, that, that coming, the salvation, the, 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 the soteriological history of God is finished on that day on the cross. The second time is in this book, and it is the final bowl of judgment, and judgment itself is finished. The third time is this moment where all of history itself is said, it is done. And human beings are re reunited with God and the earth is remade and all of his covenants have now been kept and all things restored to their creative purpose. History is served. The great story is complete. And if that does not move your heart, the hope of it, of that moment, guys, if there is even just a 1% chance that such a moment exists, it would be worth the full exertion of your life a thousand times over. All of this, he says, John says, all of this, all of history is about preparation. Preparing for something for her, for her, for her. Imagine it, all of these things made new, the heavens new, the earth made new, for her, this whole cosmic war, the suffering of God, the story of Israel, the, the story of redemption, the shedding of the blood of God, the long-suffering war against sin and all of its effects, it must be made new for her. The whole book of Revelation, this final book, the blood, the fire, the angels, the demons, the plagues, the pestilence, the empires, the dragons, the beasts, the, the whole horrifying conflict has been about a husband's love for his bride. A love so furious and so pure that it will demand that the whole universe change for her. That the heavens and the earth be transformed to ready itself for her. And he has made the world a home for her. And this new city that will replace Babylon and all of its systems needs a new earth to receive it. God loves you like that. Do you know that? Do you see that? Do you feel that burning? He loves you that much, not just to die as if that weren't enough, but to literally move heaven and earth, to remake it for you and me. He loves your students like that, staff, as annoying as they are. I'm going to invite up my musicians. I want to bring this to a close. He loves your campus like that. He loves that other campus like that, with that kind of fire, not just to die or even to rise again. 
but to remake the world. I'll finish with this story and then I want to lead you in a little act of surrender. My son, he, he's actually been here. You might have seen him, you know, working the tea bar or selling breakfast box. My oldest son, I have four boys and two girls. My oldest son, his name is Noah. And uh, we were at this, we, we went to this party in another city. And there was a girl there who's actually the daughter of one of my good friends. And she's very pretty. And he noticed that. Um, <laughs> as all 17, I think it was 17 at the time, all 17-year-old boys would and do. And, of course, she's very cool, very spiritual, and so I totally approve. And so I, w I was encouraging it. I was like, bro, go over there, say something, man. So do it. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And so the whole night I was like, go, 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 go. He's like, ah, oh, Dad, come on, man. You know, so, you know, I can't do it. You know, he just didn't want to do it. And then we found out, so we did a little, like, you know, checking, and we found out she has a boyfriend. Feel that, feel that, you know. <laughs> Words of doom and, and uh, destruction. So he's like, Dad, uh, you know, I, she has a boyfriend. You know what I said to him? So what? <laughs> I don't see a ring on that finger, you know. <laughs> Honestly, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> you got to think about it. You got to think about it. So I said, look, man, I said, just go over there and say to her, I know you have a boyfriend, but you've made a mistake. <laughs> you know? And I'm here to save you from that mistake. No. Um, you know, I said, go, go to her and say, listen, I can't do it right now, but I'd like, to make, I'd like to have a date with you in one year. I'm not ready for you. You're, you, you, you're worth it. But I want to get ready, and I want, I want to take you out one year from today. I said, just go say it, man. He's like, oh, my gosh, Dad, no. And he's like, he just goes, <laughs> this is what he said. He said, Dad, I'm not like you. And this is what I said to my son in love, and I say it to you today because I think it matters. I said to him, son, it doesn't matter who you are. It matters who she is. Do you think that any girl worth having, any woman worth pursuing, won't have suitors? Do you think any woman that you would really want to love for the rest of your life won't have a lot of people wanting to be near her and around her? Any woman worth fighting for, any woman, you're going to have to fight through to get to her. You back down now because of some small optical, obstacle, what are you saying about her? Is she worth it or not? Because I think that girl is worth it. And you don't just let some boyfriend get in your way. Hey, listen, I am glad, I am glad that Jesus Christ did not back off because you have another boyfriend. I am glad, eternally glad, that he came for me even though I carry my idols with me. I am glad that he fought through hell and the devil and death itself to get to me. And while I love another and give myself freely to the wrong things. He comes for me anyway. He comes for you anyway. Because to him, you are worth that struggle. And he battled that ancient dragon for you. He will crush him one day for you. For this world. For those students that walk those halls for those professors that teach those classes. We, my friends, are engaged in something so cosmic, so unbelievable. It demands your whole life. 
You cannot come to Jesus with half a heart. You cannot enter into this conflict halfway. You must step fully into it. Listen, today you wrote your dreams on a napkin and you offered those dreams to God. And I'm asking you tonight, will you offer also your whole self? Would you bow your heads with me? These guys are going to lead you in one last song, but listen, I have one sermon. That sermon is give your whole life to God. You will never regret it. Make yourself available. Even before I walked up here, I, 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 I again recited the same prayer I recite every day. God, this body is yours. This life is yours. Use me or don't use me. I am yours. I don't need you to do anything except take this life and let it burn for you. And if by my failure you might be glorified, then bring that on. And if by my living or my speaking or my moving or stepping out or starting a conversation or anything might give you glory, this life is yours. Would you say that with me? today, would you, would you just in your own way, in that private little space right now where it's just you and God, the God who loves you, who saves you, who is coming for you, who is throwing off your rival suitors to get to your heart, will you today say, all of me I give to you? Guys, surrender will open up your life. Guys, take your time. We're not in a hurry. I know it's late. It does not matter. These guys are going to lead you slowly into this next song. And here's what I want to do. You offered up your napkin today and you said, God, this is my dream. Take it. I want to give it to you. And I'm asking you, when, they, when this song, when they, I don't know what they're going to sing. When they start singing, I want you, when you're ready, when you feel like, I want to say yes, then you join that chorus. You stand and you sing. And if you don't want to, if you're not there yet, it's okay. Just sit where you are. It doesn't, nobody's going to judge you or anything. But when you want to, if you want to, if you want to say, yeah, all that I am, as best I know how, I want to give all of myself to you, then you carefully consider that. Like Mike said the other night, you, 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 you stand there in, in, in the, in the, at the edge, the precipice of the garbage, the mound of garbage, and you think about it. Should I wade in? Can I wade in? Do I mean it? I want you to really do that. Take stock in your life. And if you do, if you want to make that kind of surrender, then you stand when you can and you sing together as one voice.